Welcome everyone to Masterclass Live. Uh, these are our weekly sessions that allow members to interact directly with their instructors. For those, of, for those of you not familiar with Masterclass, we are an online learning platform that enables anybody to learn from the best. We have a catalog of over 80 classes with industry leaders like Martin Scorsese teaching directing, Aaron Franklin teaching barbecue, Serena Williams teaching tennis, uh, and many others. Um, for the foreseeable future, in light of current circumstances, we are providing the Masterclass Live member-only benefit to everybody to access, um, which is very exciting. My name is Davis. I am a senior creative producer at Masterclass, and joining us today is six-time World Series of Poker bracelet winner, Daniel Negreanu. Daniel, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me on. That sounds exciting, learning how to play tennis from Serena Williams. Tennis feels like a game that right now you could sort of play and socially distance enough, just don't get too close to the net and you should be good to go. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I'm trying to figure out what the other ones would be too. Chess, not so much, poker, not so much, golf maybe. Um, Online chess, there you go. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> there's a solve for everything. Yeah. So for those of you at home, we are taking live questions. So I encourage everybody to get there in the chat and uh, put in your questions for the chance to have Daniel answer them. Um, and so Daniel, to kind of kick things off, I wanted to revisit something that you mentioned in your class that has kind of been resonating with me um, lately. And it was that, uh, you know, the life of a pro poker player can be kind of solitary um, and it takes a lot of hard work and, you know, for the aspiring pros the same. Um, and while poker is a social game, there it can be kind of a hard life. And I feel like that's something that is kind of appropriate given the situation that everybody else finds himself in right now. Um, I was kind of curious if you had any thoughts on that or advice for the people at home to make best, the best use of the time that they have right now. Yeah, well, there's no question, you're absolutely right, that poker itself lends itself to being something that's a little more uh, isolated, especially with the advent of online poker in the last 15 or so years. A lot of the younger players today, the younger professionals, came up playing online. So they would spend 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day by themselves in front of a computer. And a lot of them are doing that once again. So for them, you know, they're comfortable in that environment. For a lot of you others who are extroverted and are always out and, you know, uh, are not as comfortable, I find what's helpful for me is personal challenges, goal setting, um, trying to think of like new fun things I could do. Whether it's a video game, if that's like how you want to spend four to six hours of your time, I'm not judging. Whatever it is, I, for me, I always, I, I actually don't have the boredom gene. Like I never get bored. I have like, in 2020, you can read books, you can use your phone, you can use your computer. You know what else you could do? You go to masterclass.com and you could learn stuff, right? And it's like, if you get the whole yearly subscription, which I think is the way to go, um, you know, having access to all the different courses, it's like a great way while you're at home to make, make something of it, right? Like a lot of people say that their daily lives are too busy to work out, to do a lot of these things. Well, for a lot of those people now, um, under trying times, it's opened up that opportunity. So I would say expand and, you know, your horizons, if you will, and uh, take on some things that you've been putting off for a while. Yeah, I agree. I like as a producer, I'm intimately familiar with the classes that I've created, um, but I don't have as much time to watch them. The ones that, uh, that my colleagues have made. Um, so I was recently diving into our mixology class and uh, my girlfriend and I have been enjoying some nice cocktails. Cause like, you know, I mean, that's one way to spend time, you know, during a, a great morning. idea. Yeah. You just gave me an idea for this week for me and my <laughs> wife. Cause like we were thinking about having a romantic night, mixology, make some drinks. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, well, great. So again, thank you for being here. Um, so for next, the next little segment, um, I think we're going to do something that's pretty cool. Um, we have some members of the Masterclass community who submitted hands that they would like to have you review, give them some pointers about their play, um, see what might have gone wrong or not gone wrong. Um, and they're coming in from all over the country and actually internationally as well, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and so without further ado, I'd love to, to dive into that. Are you game? Let's do it. Let's break down some hands and see what they did wrong and fix it. All right. Perfect. Um, so the first person we have joining us is Chuck, and he is coming in from Pennsylvania or dialing in from Pennsylvania. Um, and he also let us know that he has watched your class uh, two full times, which I thought was pretty, it's an impressive feat. Smart move. There's a lot to digest. Watch it once, you watch it through, and then like he reinforces things. Good idea. Oh my goodness. There's so much, there's so much to learn in the game, man. It's, it's just never ending. So, I mean, I, I've watched it twice all the way through and I've hit it a couple times here and there. So it's definitely... Definitely something that's great to use as a tool. So thank you for that. I appreciate appreciate you being here. Thanks for your time, man. 
Well, you got it. Well, we're going to break down one of your hands. I believe that we do have a video that was created from sharemypair.com. For those of you that want to share hands online that you played poker, you can go to sharemypair.com. Basically, it's very easy to just input the cards. And then what you'll have is just sort of like a video that you can share with friends and whatnot. So in this situation right here, I'm going to move this screen over so I can see. So we see Chuck here. He's in the big blind. Blinds are 8160. What I'd like to do first is kind of just go through the hand and um, just discuss what happened. And then we're going to go back before the flop. And we're going to go through every decision you made, Chuck, and see if there's anything that, you know, maybe we could fine tune. So first up, right. So first up, we have the five seat with pocket fours, and the five seat's going to raise it up, I believe. Yep. So the five fold there, and then the five seat's going to make it 360. Okay. So it's going to fold around all the way to Chuck. So Chuck's got a definitely a playable hand for 200 more. The ace four of diamonds, a good hand to see a flop with. So Chuck's going to call. And we're going to see a flop. Now this flop reads six, five, three, two spades, one diamond, giving Chuck a backdoor flush draw, which can be relevant at times. So over here, uh, Chuck decides to check. Our opponent who raised before the flop, that's 287. Okay, and Chuck elects to check raise here to 960 with, what's, with the draw. So it looks like C5 is gonna call, and we'll have a turn card. Turn is a jack. Now it's up to Chuck, there's 2,800 in there. He bets at about 1,100. And he's called. Now the river card is the king of diamonds, a complete miss for our boy Chuck. So the question is, what does he do? He decides to check. The opponent in seat five checks and wins the pot. All right. So let's take it back to the beginning. That's what happened in the hand. Poor Chuck <clears> didn't hit. But um, there's some things here we can discuss in terms of what could have been, what, what could have been done differently or a um, few things. So pre-flop, Chuck, absolutely correct. You know? You have already 160 in, it's 200,000, uh, sorry, 200 more. You're definitely supposed to call here sitting on stacks of about 8,000. Now this flop is decent for you, right? You've got an open into straight draw and the backdoor flush draw. For those that don't know what a backdoor flush draw is, it means if it comes runner, run, like diamond, diamond, he would make a flush. So that adds about a little bit of a percentage uh, advantage to your hand. So now you decide to check. Now in this spot, I like check. I like check almost 100% of the time with my entire range. In a spot like this, I don't hate occasionally leading some percentage of the time, right? You might do that with a hand like 8-9, with the hand that you have, ace-4, maybe just the 6. If you're up against an opponent who likes to check back the flop a lot, you know, and take a free card with something like king-queen, sometimes you want to lead, but a very small percentage of the time. So I like your check. Now your opponent bets 287, and you elect to check raise. And I'm curious, Chuck, what was your thinking here with your raise and why you choose to raise to 960? All right, so we're we're in generally early stage of a tournament here. I think we're like level six. Um, we're both um, about 50 bigs deep. I like to talk in terms of big blinds. It helps me yeah. kind of, you know, dictate how I play my strategy. But anyway, so I get ace four. When the flop comes out, six, three, five with a diamond. I'm open-ended. I got the back door flush draw, like you said. Um, I'm definitely looking at that flop. Like, I, I crush that. Um so I'm looking like instantly, as soon as I seen that flop, my idea was to check raise. Okay. Um, you know, now I gotta, I'm just going to interject real quick. What were you trying to accomplish with the check raise? Did you want your opponent to fold, call, re-raise? Like, did you think about that when you check raise? Like, what do you want him to do? Yes. I mean, I want him to continue with his, with, with bigger over cards that may miss and whiff completely by the time the river comes. Um, he's going to continue with a lot of flush draws, I think. A lot of bigger over suited connectors. Um, maybe some like pocket sevens or something he's going to continue with where he has a gut shot and stuff like All that. Right. I'm going to stop you right there. So a lot of the hands that you're talking about, you want him to continue with, you don't. Okay. You okay. really don't. You want the, so here's the thing. What's really, really important with poker is when you are going to decide to make a bet, a raise, a check, a call, whatever, especially with a bet or a raise, you need to either be thinking to yourself, I, I'm, I'm value betting or I'm bluffing. In this okay. case, the way that you're describing it sounds like you're kind of doing a little bit of both which means right. you're not doing either, right? You have to be clear what you want your opponent to do, what you're trying to accomplish. If I have your hand, if I'm check raising, I'm trying to accomplish getting him out. Because if he calls, there's a lot of bad turn cards if I don't catch. And I'm out of position. When you're out of position, you don't necessarily want to blow pots too much. So I would probably suggest just calling here on the flop, take, peeling one off, 
If it goes check check on the turn, you might be able to steal it on the river with a bet or something along those lines. But I wouldn't have overplayed it quite as much in the flop too often. But it's not terrible. It's not terrible. So now your opponent calls with the fours. Okay, and let's see the uh, turn card, please. Let's see that turn card, if you don't mind, on sharemypair.com. All right. So we've got the turn card. It's a jack. All right. So now there's about 2,800 in the pot, and you elect to bet 1,100. Now, what were you trying to accomplish here? Um, so honestly, like my idea on the, on the turn here was I wanted to continue my story that I have all the bigger value hands like sets and seven. I could have seven four suited. I feel like in my range, I could have deuce four suited in my range. I definitely want to continue the story. I don't want to take my foot off the gas just yet, if that's part of the plan. Um, so I decided to to bet about, um, I think it's about like 30 or 40 percent pot. Um, my question was when I when I submitted my hand was like, is that a line that I want to go? Is the sizing right? Should I go bigger, smaller? Not really. Yeah, sure. So. There. That's a good question. And I'll, we'll get, so I like, I actually don't mind your sizing because you've already check raised the flop. As you said, you can sort of tell the story and you know, you've told one right now, so you can go ahead and bet. And it's very unlikely your opponent's going to raise you here. He raised an early position. He probably doesn't have seven, four or two, four, right. he wouldn't play those hands. So if he raises you, most of the time it's going to be a set. If he's got a set, so be it full. So you essentially set your own price for the draw. And I like that. Here's the okay. thinking. Well, I'm going to get to this on the river when we go there next. But when you make this bet, it must come in combination with the river. So what you need to be thinking about when you're playing is, all right, if I bet this now, what am I going to do if I catch my card? What am I going to do if it's a spade? What am I going to do if I miss? If you're not combining this bet with an idea of what to do on the river, then you're just kind of like clicking buttons, right? So when you check raise here, and your, and your opponent, when, sorry, when you bet here and your opponent calls, are you thinking to yourself, what if a nine comes on the river? What are you going to do? Are right. you thinking that term, in those terms? I mean, I was, and I wasn't at the same time. I mean, um, obviously you see the, the river card here in a second, but um, the thoughts weren't flowing through my head at that point. I was, I was literally focused on just, you know, telling the story and trying to commit to that story. Great. Um, so let's go to the river real quick and let's see the river. The river is a king of diamonds. All right. Great. So you've been telling this story. You've been telling the story on the flop. Check raise. You've been, you told the story on the turn. Bet. And now you forgot to tell the rest of the story. <laughs> right. Right? You're like, oh, man, now what? So when you bet that, when you play this line as aggressively as you do, when you check raise the flop, you need to be thinking in your, in your mind, okay, what do I do if I miss turn and river? What cards am I going to bet? What cards am I going to check? You always want to be thinking one street ahead, much like in chess. You want to be thinking... Um, a couple steps ahead of your opponent. In this case, it felt like you sort of like, okay, I like this flop. I'm going to check raise here. I guess I can bet this turn. And now the river came. You're like, oh no, I didn't think about what to do now. So you sort of, because I think if you would have jammed, this, I think when you bet this turn as played, you have to go all in on a lot of rivers with 6,000 right. left. There's, you basically got a pot size bet left and there's a lot of chips out there that you're just sort of leaving out and you don't beat much, right? Yeah. Maybe, He's not going to call you with like, he might fold nines or tens when the, you know, you bet this way. So you can get him off some hands. Uh, and I think if you're going to tell the story, make sure that you're thinking, all right, where does this story end? And, uh, and how do I finish it? Right. No, I think, I think you definitely hit it on the head when I, when I got to the river, like so many things went through my mind. I was like, should I preserve my chips here? Like, I know I have like the worst possible hand I could have in this situation. Like, I feel like I know I'm supposed to empty the clip, but is it worth the risk? Um, you know, it's, right. it's, if it ain't worth the risk, don't put yourself in that spot. Anyways, we got a bunch of hands I want to get to, Chuck. I want to thank you for sending in yours. It sounds to me like you've learned a lot um, over the last, uh, you know, couple of viewings of the masterclass. I can hear the way you're thinking about hands. You just missed one part of it, and that's planning ahead to the next street. So good luck in your next events, my man. I really appreciate it. Good luck to you, man. Thanks, man. Thank you very much, Chuck. All right. Uh, that was a fun one. I, I actually learned a lot too, because I came into this producing your class, not knowing a really a thing about poker and now, uh, speak the language relatively well and, uh, definitely and we'll be rethinking the way that I do things going forward. Um, so the next person we have joining us is Dennis. Uh, so Dennis is a firefighter. So if an alarm goes off uh, and he runs out the door without saying goodbye, that's why, uh, hopefully we'll forgive him. Um, but Dennis, thank you for joining. Oh, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I appreciate being here and, and kind of piggyback on what Chuck said, uh, you know, obviously appreciate your time, but that, that workbook that's on the masterclass that goes along with the video and, and all the uh, charisma that goes into that video, 
that workbook was phenomenal and it really tied in a lot for me. So I, I appreciate that content. Well, you're absolutely welcome. I'm glad I could make it for you. I'm curious to see what we've got in store with your hand, Dennis. So why don't we go ahead to the sharemypair.com um, viewing and see where we're at. All right, so we've got Dennis here playing five cent, 10 cent in early position, sitting on about 10 bucks, a little over nine. And let's go ahead and see what you got. All right, so you got the king, queen of hearts. And I, I imagine you're gonna come in with a raise. Let's take a look. All righty, so you make it 30 cents, okay. Um, if I, if I, I assume that's what everybody's coming in with, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now you get called for 30 cents by the jack nine of diamonds from early position, folds around to the blinds and both, both, so the big blind also calls, I believe. Yes, or yeah, both blinds and the, both blinds, so we got a four-way pot. All right, now, it is check to you, I believe. C1 checks, C2 mm -hmm. checks, check, check, and then it's up to you. You're gonna bet 86 cents into $1.20 with top pair. All right, so seat five here with the big draw, the jack nine of diamonds is gonna call you. Small blind, gone. Big blind, also gone. Let's have a turn card. Turn card is an eight. You still got the top pair, almost three bucks in there. You're going to bet 208, okay? And now the player here with the five, five yeah, with the, with the draw is going to call the $2. River is a seven, pretty innocuous. Okay, so there's seven bucks in the pot and you elect to check. Okay, and he bets 324 and you go ahead and make the call, I believe. Okay, so unlucky River for you, but the guy did have a lot of outs. All right, very interesting mm -hmm. hand. Let's take it from the top. Shall we? <laughs> All right. So, you know, this is uh, a hand where three times the big blind was typically thinning the field down to just, you know, one or two opponents. And this time I got more callers, but this guy to my left, he'd been there for two hours. So I had a pretty good feel. Immediately I knew aces, kings, queens were out and he was playing some type of uh, draw or maybe a combination of Broadway cards. Oh, okay. uh, the small blind, big blind made me a little nervous. It checked to me and my C bet was. Oh, well, hang on. Really hang on. More... Hold the phone. Hold okay. the phone, because I, I want to go street by street if you don't mind. Oh, so sorry, let, me, uh, let me just jump in here. Okay, so 30 cents with the king, queen of diamonds. Can't fault it. If that's the standard in the game, not a lot of problems with it. I personally prefer to come in for 25 cents at these stack depths um, because there's no ante. So you're not getting as, as good of a price, 30 cents to steal 15. But it's mm -hmm. fine. It's not a mistake. It's just like a personal preference. So you make it 30 cents. Next player decides to call it the jack nine of diamonds. All right, so you... Sounds like you've already said you range assessed him where he doesn't have aces or kings because mm -hmm. he would re-raise before the flop. Folds around. We've got both blinds who call. So you've got a really nice hand that plays well post-flop with king-queen suited in a multi-way pot. Let's go ahead and have the flop now. All right. So flop is king, 10, deuce, two diamonds. It's check to you. And now you bet 86 cents. Now, you, I wanna, mm -hmm. I'm curious as to why you chose that bet size on this flop. My typical bet in this position would be two thirds the pot. So that's generally the guideline and I don't want to, you know, create betting size tells. So whether I've hit it or I'm just doing a C bet bluff, I will typically go two thirds pot. Okay. And that's fine. Um, GTO, you know, I talked a little bit about GTO. It's mm -hmm. that short term for game theory, optimal game theory, optimal play is going to dictate that you're going to make much smaller C bets like quarter to a third pot but I don't have a problem with what you're doing. It's exploitative. It can be exploited, but if you're comfortable with that, I'm comfortable with that on a spot like that. So 86 cents into 120. It's really making the draws pay. We see the first player here call with the draw, both players fold. And now we have a turn card. Let's see that turn again. It's an eight, I believe. All right. So now there's 292 in the pot and you elect to bet a little over $2. Now, what were you thinking with this sizing? Same idea? Same ideas. It's pretty consistent when I get to that turn. And if I'm going to hit that second bullet, I'll, I'll keep that sizing about the same. I did feel like I was ahead in this hand. I felt like I was going up against draws. It was the ace, the king or the queen and the jack that I was in a nine. Those were the, the cards that I was kind of worried about, um, you know, mainly ace, queen, jack. Uh, so, you, you know, when the river comes, it, it didn't put my uh, yeah, yeah. red flag up as much as I should, but. Okay, so I like, I like how you're thinking and it's important when you're playing a poker hand to think about how to think, okay? And you're doing a lot of really good things here by when you make this bet, you're putting your opponent on a range of hands, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking, okay, he doesn't have ace king, ace is king, so you rule those out if you will a little bit. A lot of draws, queen jack, ace five of diamonds, jack nine of diamonds, something like that. So you've got him in a pretty good spot. Could have pocket tens, you know, you gotta, you gotta mm -hmm. factor in some of that stuff too occasionally. But right. so you're gonna bet here, an amount that uh, charges him pretty well for the draw. He elects to call once again. And the river card's a seven. 
All right. And now you elect to, there's $7 in the pot. He's got 324 left. And you elect to check. And I'm wondering what you were thinking here. Why did you check? Well, this is the absolute weakest part of my game. And it was really what the question was about is, you know, a lot of the time when I'm playing, I just started playing poker again. I was one of those 2003 through 2008 players that played live only. So this online thing is really new to me. And I got to the river and I really didn't know what to do because it had to be specifically Jack nine. And I didn't want to put myself in a reverse implied odds situation. Um, you know, if he did have the tens or the King 10, things of that sort. And I was anticipating him checking. And when he bet back, it put me in yeah. another tough spot to make a decision. Right. So here's the thing. He's not checking any of those hands that you just mentioned. He's betting right. them anyway. Right. So mm -hmm. there's two hands, two hands to be worried about. Okay. Jack nine of diamonds is one pocket mm -hmm. tens. I wouldn't worry about. I think he'd raise you in the turn, but he could mm -hmm. also possibly have seven, eight of diamonds. Right. Those are the only hands that beat you. Okay. Um, he could have King Jack. He could be calling you with a 10. Here's the issue. And this is a t difficult situation where it comes within player reads, right? Is this mm -hmm. player the type that if you check, he's going to bluff? Or is he the player that is never going to really, really bluff here? So you want to go ahead and bet. If your player is bluff happy and you know that, you check to him because you're not folding this hand, right? Mm -hmm. Under in no circumstance are you folding, right? So if he's not somebody that's bluff happy and you're going to call anyway, you got to make sure you get that bet. Like if he if he checked back king nine suited or king jack suited here, mm -hmm. and you didn't get that last three twenty four, you really blew it. Like you free rolled yourself, right? Yeah. You're putting in that three twenty four every time. One hundred percent of the time you're behind, you're calling. You're always calling him for the three twenty four, but you miss value against some hands that he might call you with where he checks back. Does that make sense? That does make sense, and it, it's that third street, or that third bullet that is the the most challenging one. Right. Seven bucks in there, 324 left. Put it in. If he's got you beat, say la vie, you move on. Hope that helped you, Dennis. Oh, it absolutely helps me. Thank well, you. Great. Well, thanks again for uh, signing up to Masterclass and sending in that really cool hand. On to the next one, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so next up, we have uh, Rich joining us, and uh, he is zooming in from New Jersey. Um, so excited to see what hand he's got on deck for you guys to check out. And there he is. Hi, Rich. Hey, guys. How's it going, Rich? Oh, it's going real good, Daniel. How about with you? Oh, it's good. They're going great. I got, I'm real curious to see what this big old hand is that you played. All right, good. Let's, uh, let's have a look at it. All right. So, Rich, you're in the small blind. All right. What, what I'm going to do here, Rich, is I'm just going to go through the hand first and explain sure. it, what happened. And then we're going to go back to the preflop and go through every street and get some thoughts on what you were thinking. All right. Let's no problem. let it roll. Okay, so we have a player in late position with two sixes in the eight seat, six in a, sitting on about 60,000 in chips. Blinds of three, so he min raises with the sixes, okay. Folds around to our man Rich in the small blind who elects to call, right, with the king queen. All right. Yeah, all right, so we have a heads up pot. Let's see the flop. All right, so <laughs> unfortunate flop for you. You flop top pair, kings. You decide to check, I imagine. Yes. All right, and the three sixes goes ahead and bets um, about a quarter pot, 1.28. Yeah. All right, and now it's back to you with the king queen, and you elect to just call. I like it. Correct. All right, let's have a turn card. Turn card's a four of clubs. You elect to check again. The opponent bets uh, about two thirds pot now. Four yeah, a little more. Yeah, a little more. And you've called again. All right, and the river card is a five. Okay, so now 15,000 in the pot. You check, opponent with the three sixes. Bets pot, full pot. Okay. Right. So now you call and see the bad news. All right. Let's go back to pre-flop and discuss the pre-flop situation and what he could have done differently, if possible. All right. Let's go back to the beginning. All right. So, Rich, um, late position raise. Small blind is one of the worst spots to be from. Your hand is too strong to fold, though, right? Right. What I'd like you to do occasionally in a spot like this is throw in some three bets. Not right. a ton. Not a ton but maybe like 20, 25% of the time, you know, you want to throw in a three bet and you want to do that against the type of players that are very, very active. Okay. If it's a, if it's a very loose player who's opening a lot, you re-raise them. If it's a tighter player, in some cases, maybe fold, probably not, or just flat. As played, I see nothing wrong with just calling here, taking a flop with your hand, having a quarter of the bet in. So you call, let's see the flop. Now the flops King Jack six, you decide to check. And I want to note here, in a spot like this, when you call from the small blind, um, 
don't it, you should almost never bet. So I like your check a lot here, Rich. Some players, they're like, oh, I have top pair. I'm going to bet out and protect my right. hand. But you can't do that in a balanced fashion. And when I say balanced, what I'm referring to is where, you know, you're bluffing some, you're value betting some. More often, it's going to be value. So I like your check. And there's no flush draw here. Your opponent bet. I like just check calling here um, on the flop. There's no reason to go ahead and raise and overplay the flop. So uh, really nothing to discuss here because it's pretty straightforward. Everything you've done here is exactly what a pro would do. Okay. So that should be good news for you. Yep. All right. Now the turn card comes a, king, a four of clubs. You would again, check hundred percent standard. Your opponent goes ahead and bets four, four, um, 4,200. Now, what are you thinking here when you see that bet size? What kind of hands are you putting your opponent on? Yeah, I'm a little concerned because at, from the get go, um, this guy had been pretty conservative. I had been on the table with him for about two hours. Um, so part of the hands that I put him on were low pocket pairs. So when I saw um, the four, I, I really thought it was in his range that he had pocket fours and had trips, especially when he uh, uh, had his bet, uh, you know, go up to two thirds pot instead of the small quarter sized pot bet that he made originally. So I was a little bit concerned, but I thought my hand was too strong at this point to fold. And I also felt like there was no way I could re-raise and try to three bet in this situation. So that's why I elected just to call. Okay, so we're gonna do a little exercise here for everybody watching. So here's how you wanna break down spots like this, okay? You've checked your opponent's bet. Let's first figure out all the value hands he has that beat us, okay? Aces, kings. Ace King, King Jack, pocket sixes. You mentioned pocket fours. I think that's kind of obscure. It's possible, sure, that's in the right. range. He could also, because he's in late position, have King Six suited, right? King Four suited. So there's a whole bunch of value hands he could have. Now let's ask the question what type of hands would he bet the flop with and then continue to bet on the turn with? Can you think of a few, Rich, that he might be, might well, have sure. that he can beat? Sure, absolutely. Um, that I can beat. I mean, yes. he could certainly have a draw. He could have uh, queen 10. He could have ace 10. I don't think he's going to have ace queen in this situation. I feel like he would have bet a little bit more uh, pre-flop instead of just a min well, I don't know about that. I'd, hold, I'd stop there because, you know, most people, they come in for a raise size, they stick with it. Whether it's fours, sixes, ace, mm -hmm. queen, ace, king, they just come in with a raise size. There's a whole bunch of other draws here you're not seeing. The club on the turn, he could have ace- right. Queen of clubs, could have ace, 10 of clubs, could have seven, eight, could have a whole bunch of hands. So now what you do, and this is the whole point of the exercise is, right? You count all the combinations of value hands that he has. So we've discussed mm -hmm. those, you know, the ace, king, the kings, the sets, all those things. And then the amount of bluffs that he has. And now we're going to compare that to the type of player that we described, right? You mentioned he was kind of tight, you know, usually has really good hands in these spots. So we mm -hmm. might sway and say, okay, so he's maybe more likely to have one of these hands that beat us than not. Having said that, your hand's a little bit too good right now to, to fold, right? Because he might right. have king, he might, he might think his king 10 is good or king nine suited. So he you might, kind yeah. of are forced to at least call the turn card, right? right? So you make the call and let's go to the river now. Yep. All right, the river is a five and you of course check and your opponent bets the full pot. So now you're getting two to one odds, okay? And Correct. this is where poker can be as complicated as you want it to be. If you really want to get to the elite level, you can do all the math. If you don't and you just want to, you know, play for fun and all that kind of stuff, no problem because the math is a little bit complicated, all right? Now right. what we would do is we would count all the combinations of hands that beat us, compare that to the bluffs that missed, okay? And if that equation is right around two to one or not quite, now we can sort of make this call. Based on what you described to this player, right? Yeah. Sounds like he's got a hand that beats you here, right? You didn't feel good about it when you made the no, call. No, I did not. I certainly did not. But again, I looked at my, um, I looked at my chips and I thought, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm still in this tournament. I was actually in eighth place at the time. And um, I thought that if I made this call and won, I would have actually been a chip leader. Um, and if I lost, I, was, I wasn't out of the tournament. So that, that kind of factored into my thinking a little sure. bit. Well, let me tell you what, Rich, just to make you feel even better about it. If yeah. you're thinking of that whole game theory optimal thing, like if you were yeah. playing against the perfect opponent, right? Let's say you were playing against the, a robot. You played the hand 100% correct on every street. 
Like you've made zero mistakes. Now, having said that, you weren't quite playing against that player. So sometimes what this is the this is my favorite part of poker, right? Because we don't play against robots. You know, as Davis mentioned, it's a social game. You know, we play against people. So we can always pick up on tendencies and take advantage of people. So in a spot like this, what I found, especially in lower limits, uh, you know, that you're likely playing in smaller buying tournaments, people are less likely to run a bluff that's bet flop, turn, and river in a spot like this. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to have a very strong hand. Now you're you're pretty high up in your range of hands that you could have. Okay. Now that's another, we could go on for literally 45 minutes about, you know, where you are in your range, but you're, you have about as good a hand as you could have right here. So I really, I I really do overall, I would say rich that I wouldn't have changed anything that you did. I just, the only thing I would suggest is make sure on the turn, you know, you're making, you're doing that little mental exercise of going, all right, what hands beat me? What hands would he be bluffing with? And if you can't find any hands that he'd be bluffing with, Oh, well then uh, if all you got is hands that beat you, time to jump ship. Yeah, I hear you. All right, well, thanks, Thank man. So thanks much. for sending in the hand. I hope that helped you. And, uh, yes. you know, hey, you're, you know, you're the first one in who's like played the hand 100% perfect. So there you go. Uh, thanks a lot, Daniel. I really exactly. appreciate it. You got it, buddy. Thank you very much. Um, so, Daniel, that wraps up our, our hand review segment. Um, what we're going to do now is dive into some questions that have been submitted live while uh, the session's been going on. Um, and also for those of you just joining us, this is Masterclass Live. We're here with Daniel Negreanu. He's talking about his Masterclass. He's talking about poker, life, things of that nature. Um, so we're happy to have everybody here. Um, so the first live question we have is from Matt. And he said, um, how do you read your, your opponents while you're playing online poker? Which I think okay. is interesting. I have that same question. Yeah. So online poker, they, most sites that you're going to play on, I play you know, inter- internationally, GG Poker not here in the United States, but I know that they have this in their software. Most sites will have an option for you to keep notes. Okay. And I would highly suggest that you do that. Obviously you're not going to get reads of their face, right? You can look for timing tells online. Okay. So for example, if a player normally takes about seven or eight seconds to make his decision and now all of a sudden he's acted instantly, well, that lets you know, he didn't have a marginal decision. He wasn't humming and hawing. So he's very clear on what he's going to do. And that's going to mean something. So look for stuff like that in terms of actual physical, you know, tells. Besides that, you're going to be looking for betting pattern, betting pattern patterns, right? Um, how often are they opening? How often are they playing early position? And always take notes on anything you see that's obscure, right? So this guy defended his big, and I might do a short, I'm always going to do shorthand. I'll be like, you know, I'll put raise, cut off, you know, defended BB, you know, donk led, Mm -hmm. you know, on a King Jack four. So you put the little notes on the hand. The next time you play against that player, you have at least a few hands that you can look at and sort of get some tendencies. This player, you know, three bets a lot. This player is very aggressive. This player is very passive. This player always has it. So the more data you collect, the more, uh, you know, accurate your reads are going to be when playing online poker. So definitely utilize the notes and the hand history function. So what you can also do when you play online, at the end of the hand, click on the little icon there, take a look at the hand, maybe jot it down and maybe dissect it later and see, you know, if you can pick up anything on your opponents. Makes a lot of sense. And it, it reminds me too, like I, the thing that really, one of the things, one of the many things that really kind of struck me um, when we were making your class is uh, that there is a lot of uh, glamor around like the tells, the, the, you know, drip of sweat coming down somebody's face, but really it's about kind of like a lie detector test, like where you set a norm for somebody and you look for deviations from them. Um, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, uh, I would actually suggest, and I think online poker, especially now considering what we're dealing with, it's a great way to learn to play the game itself, to learn the fundamentals of how to play poker. All the rest of the stuff, you know, seeing through somebody, looking for tells and some of the things that I share in Masterclass, um, that's like the second step. You know, it's, it's fancy in movies to see like, oh, the Oreo cookie, he ate the cookie when he was bluffing, he didn't eat the cookie when he had it, you know. Um, that's like the fun stuff, but you got to learn the nuts and bolts first. Great. Well, thank you. I hope Matt uh, got something out of that. I'm sure he did. Um, so we have uh, another question here that came in live from Emilio. Um, and he just said, what do you do when you are on tilt? Okay. So that's a question I could answer very broadly, both in life and in poker. What do you do when things go bad in your life? Right. There are two types of people. Some people that have something that, you know, like was a, not a good thing <laughs> happened in their life and like they crumble and they complain and they whine and they 
you know, complain about their bad luck. And then others go, okay, so that happened. How am I going to respond to that now? Am I going to take the responsible approach and ask myself, what can I do to better the situation? Or am I just going to blame everything but myself? So in poker, you're going to find situations where you do everything right. Like rich. Everything. Yes. You do everything right and just so be it. You know, you have bad luck. The focus is on the journey. Like, did I make all the right plays? And if I did, so be it. If I didn't, now there's a learning experience in here. I've always said this. I believe like, you know, making mistakes is natural. We all do it. The real mistake is not learning anything from those mistakes. So when you do make them, it's important to learn from them. As far as like how to deal with tilt, um, you know, if that, that's an issue that I would hope through time gets better. It doesn't for everybody. I may take three deep breaths at the table. Sometimes I actually do this. I've been on TV where I literally close my eyes, take three deep breaths and sort of reset myself. Other things I'll do is I experience the experience. I'm a big believer in that sort of, you know, new agey stuff where I'm like, internally, I just vent to myself. I'm like, this dummy did this, played the stupid hand, took all my chips. He's going to go out of the tournament, but he screwed me and da da da. All right, whew, got it out of my system. Now I like literally internally make, take the three, three deep breaths and then say to myself, what do I want to experience right now? I want to experience focus. I want to be engaged. I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. And I want to, you know, be, you know, just be determined. And uh, it doesn't happen immediately, but it happens a lot faster than it would if you just let it stew. The worst thing I see is when a guy lost a hand an hour and a half ago, right? Two hours ago, still talking about it. You know, if he's still talking about it, he's not focused on the game. He's stuck in a, an hour and a half right? So you really got to be present, you know, understand the mistakes are going to happen. Don't beat yourself up too hard. But if you do feel like you're not in a good mindset to continue playing, get up. Don't, don't continue. Just quit the session. If you're in a tournament, unfortunately, you can't do that. Okay. But if you're playing for money and you're playing cash and you just feel like, you know, you're not at your best, take some time off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's, uh, that's really good insight for, like you said, for life and for poker. Um, you know, I've, I've been, uh, been practicing some mindfulness techniques and that's exactly what you're saying. You know, it's, it's, uh, there's an element, an element of it, which is acceptance and, and non-striving and, uh, and kind of separating yourself from your emotions and recognizing that they are not, uh, the thing that's actually happening. You know, your emotions are your thoughts about something. Um, anyway, so I find that really. No. And, and another you know, important point of that too, is like, you have to let yourself experience the emotion. Like when you hide it, Put it on there. You think you're, you know, you think it's gone. It's not. It's in your gut. It's in your stomach, and you're still boiling. So just yeah. like, you know, I like, I, I find the the process of just being present to that feeling in the moment. Like I, I'm, I'm upset. I'm annoyed. I'm gonna rage. And when I'm when I'm playing online, I can do it even more. A lot of poker players, professionals, have gone through a case of mice. You know, like a mouse that you use to play poker. They've gone through a case because they lose a hand, and that thing just gets launched against the wall. I had a friend. This is a true story. Took his laptop. Okay. His, actually, no, it was his whole computer. He lost, he lost, you know, for three, four hours straight, grabbed the entire thing, threw it off his balcony into a swimming pool. Okay. I'm not suggesting do that, but uh, experience the experience. Yeah. yeah. Maybe vent internally rather than externally if you yeah. can. You know? Right. Um, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so moving on, um, let's see. We have uh, a question here from Hunter. Um, so do you have any advice on times when you're running cold for long periods of time and how you've gotten out of those? Uh, situations. And similarly, he also wanted to know how you escape those mentally. But I think we did, we kind of touched on that part. Right. So running cold can sort of be answered two different ways. Running cold in terms of like, so I haven't been any good cards lately or running cold and I just keep losing a lot and I'm on a bad streak. So I'm going to answer both of those because they're different. Um, there are times where say you go through a run where you're just getting nine, three, eight deuce, whatever. If you've developed an image at the table where you're the guy that hasn't played a hand in an hour, most thinking players are paying attention to that. So if you're not getting any card, you can sort of manufacture situations. Let's say you're in a situation where like kind of a loose player opens and he's been opening a lot and then a player calls behind and you're in the button or you're in the small blind and you pick up king five offsuit, a hand you'd fold. Well, occasionally you can throw in a pretty good size three bet before the flop and just kind of stay alive by picking up a few chips here and there. You're going to get a lot of credit because you're the guy that hasn't played you know, a pot for an hour. Occasionally, you'll run into a hand, and that's okay. But um, that's one of the ways where you can sort of stay in the game. Now, the so other way to answer, on, Daniel, could you just for those at home who might not be super familiar with poker terminology, the three bet? Would you mind just defining that really quickly? Sure. So, a three bet pre-flop is okay. So, if somebody's raised right before the flop, it's an additional raise. So, mm -hmm. instead of just calling the bet, a three bet is the typical term for 
once there's been a raise, you're doing a re-raise uh, before the flop. So Thank that's a three bet. All right. Yeah. And the other way to answer that question about like how, we're, how to handle when things are going cold, um, I would say that's a really good opportunity to really dissect your game and take a lot of notes on the decisions you're making, making sure your mindset is good and you're playing as well as you can. You know, if you have peers that you play with, run those hands by them. Um, I would suggest like shorter sessions too. You know, maybe book some small wins. Don't let yourself get too down on yourself um, because it can be tough and everyone's going to go through it and know that, right? Know that uh, if you're fo- if you looking at the hands and you're like, you had pocket aces, you got it all in against Jack nine and the player beat you, okay? You did nothing wrong. And I, and I know it sucks because it happened twice in a row or three times or five times, but it'll turn. In the end, everyone, you know, has roughly the same amount of luck. Some are luckier than others in the long run, but, you know, as long as your mindset is that you're one of those people, you're already off to a, uh, you know, a head start. Great. Well, thank you. And that's so, yeah, that's so interesting. I love that you hit on both ways of approaching that because there is a way to turn that into an opportunity within reason by mixing it up a little bit with, with the hands that you're playing, but also a uh, valuable time for, for introspection and tinkering with your game and finding leaks and stuff like that for sure. Um, well, cool. Thank you. All right. So moving on, um, let me see. Let's see. Um, okay, so how important, this is from uh, Brandon. Um, how important is physical conditioning due to the time spent at the table? And who is, mo- and well, actually, it's, this is a two part question. First one is about physical conditioning, given that you're pretty sedentary, can be. Uh, and then the second was, uh, who is the most consi- consistently tough opponent that you've ever faced? Okay, so you know, it's an interesting question because if you look at old World Series of Poker videos from the 70s and 80s, you'll see guys that are overweight smoking cigarettes at the table, drinking whiskey, you know, in a cloudy, smoky room, totally unhealthy. They do not look like athletes, if you will. Like, it's why when people say poker is a sport, I'm like, I don't know, look at those guys. However, when you look at the shift in the last five to six years, I've been going to the gym for 10 years myself and, you know, always felt that that was important. But if you look at the highest, the high rollers of the high rollers, the ones who were playing buy-ins with $100,000 or a million, the absolute toughest of the tough, Almost to a man, they're in shape and they're in the gym. They're focusing on mindfulness, as you mentioned, to get their mind state right and also their, their body right. In a lot of cases, you know, I'll play 14 hours a day for seven straight days, getting a lack of sleep, right? So if you're not physically fit, you know, you'll get sick, you'll be worn down. And then when you need to really dig deep and make that difficult, crucial decision, your mind is a fog, right? So every little edge can help you. And being physically fit, I can't imagine many things in life where I'd say, yeah, no, physically being physically fit, definitely don't want to do that. Right. I mean, it's kind of like a given as far as the second part of your question, my goodness, throughout the years, there's been so many tough players that I've played against. And one of them, uh, if you are a masterclass member, you'll have the luxury of, you know, delving into his uh, brain as well. And that's Phil Ivey. So the opportunity to dig into Phil Ivey's brain, who very rarely shares anything about poker. And he's doing that here in masterclass. Um, that is a special opportunity for those that play because he's as tough, tough, you know, tough as nails. He reminds me a lot. I'm watching that the last dance. If you guys are watching the ESPN and I know that they've actually played golf, him and, uh, Phil Ivey, but like, they remind me so much of each other as well as Tiger Woods. Like they're all just premier athletes in what they do. And they all have that like intense focus and that killer instinct, you know, like me and Phil are really good friends, but when we're at the poker table, he wants to eat my head. He wants to like chew my face out, spit it out and just destroy me, emasculate me, dominate you, you know, like that's just how he's built. So uh, I'd say, you know, Phil Ivey, and he's also an all around athlete, if you will, in that he plays all the games. He's not a one trick pony, he just plays Hold'em. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Um, yeah, and there was, nope, there was a thing that you said something and I was like, I want to tell him that thing, but I, I lost it. So we'll, we'll move on to the, to the members who are, or to the people at home who are submitting questions. Um, so let's see. Um, this question is from Will, and he asked, uh, when building a bankroll, how do you know when to increase the stakes uh, that you're playing at? Okay, so that's going to be a personal choice based on your own personal risk and your own personal ability to take on risk, right? So if you live at home, you know, your parents cook for you, you know, you're, you get three meals a day, you got rent covered, you got payments covered for phone, everything like that, you can be a lot more risky, right? If you actually have a monthly nut that's significant and you need to, you know, meet the, uh, that monthly nut to pay your bills, you have to be a little bit more careful. Um, 
there isn't exactly a set number because it also depends on your personal win rate. How good are you, right? So the amount of money, for example, Davis would need to play 510 would be a lot different than what I would need to play 510 or what I'd be comfortable playing with because my win rate's going to be bigger than yours, I promise. <laughs> so, I think I'd need about a million dollars, I think, right. to, in a bankroll for me personally. So what I would suggest as a strategy, if you do con want to consider moving up in limits, is if you, if you do have a solid win rate at the limit you're playing, and you're keeping track, I hope, all of you, you're keeping track, whether it's live or online, of your results, you know, your, your win rate per hand or your win rate per hour, I think it's very important to do that so you have an, an idea of where you're really at. So when you see that your win rate at a certain limit is pretty good, I would suggest occasionally, if you feel comfortable, the surplus in bankroll, you feel comfortable with that. So let's say, for example, and I'm just throwing a random number out, let's say you had $10,000 to play, uh, you know, two five, okay? And that's, you know, that's your bankroll. If you feel comfortable playing two five with $5,000, maybe you take 2,000 or 2,500 and you take a shot with that and play the 510. If you lose that though, it's gonna be important to shift your mindset back to going, okay, that shot didn't work. I got to go back to the other limit where I know I can win. That can be tricky for a lot of players though, because every, you know, when a lot of people see it as like retracting and moving down in stakes and sort of like, uh, you know, going backwards in life. It's very important to humble yourself in those moments. I've gone throughout my career through stages where I was playing $400, $800 limits all the way back down to 30 and $60 limits because, you know, things didn't go well. And I, you know, kept having to go down. Uh, you have to be humble in those moments. Um, and it's okay to take shots when you feel comfortable with it. But again, ultimately, it's going to be a personal choice in terms of how much risk you're willing to take. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's really, that's really great insight too, not surprisingly, because it's coming from you. But um, just like giving yourself that a uh, little bit to, to dip your toe into the water with if you can, if you can swing it to uh, see how that plays out for you. You know, instead of being like, I'm doing it. Don't do the, the rounders thing. I forget which character it was, but... Uh, you know, <laughs> work. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, all right. Well, so moving on here, um, this is uh, a question from Amy, and she asks, um, how do you feel about players wearing sunglasses and hoodies at the table? I wish that, I mean, I don't care about hoodies so much. I mean, sometimes it gets cold in the poker rooms and like it's hot, it's cold. So layers make sense, right? You're wearing a t-shirt and you have a hoodie. So if it gets, you know, you can go back and forth. Wearing the hoodie over your head and covering your face like one guy does, it looks like, uh, I don't want to say because it's graphic, but he, he puts a hoodie all the way up to his face and covers it. Um, that's a little much. The sunglasses, I actually personally, if I were to run events, I would like to see them banned because I think part of poker is being able to read, you know, read your opponents. Um, but uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So uh, I don't feel like they're necessary. I feel as though partly when you wear sunglasses, you're sort of setting out, you're telling me that you're afraid. That's what I'm hearing. Part of what I'm seeing is like, okay, you're afraid I'm going to see right through you. And a lot of times when people do wear sunglasses, they think they're invincible. They think they're like in a cloak, like, oh, you can't see me, but I can see your neck pulse. I can see your fingers. I see everything else. So it's a false sense of security a lot of times because people think, well, they can't see my eyes, so he can't get a read on me. That's not all I'm looking at. That's really, yeah, that's really, really interesting. So do you, do you adjust your play at all with, for that, that, that type of person? Or is like the aesthetics not a consideration at all and you're purely looking at the hands that they're playing? Well, I'm always going to look for an advantage any time I can. So as I said, if I find that somebody wearing sunglasses, wearing them because they're afraid, I'll go all Ivy on them and I'll try to almost bully them. Like not physically, I'm not going to punch them, but I may actually look at them more like, yeah, you know, if you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, where he goes, <sighs> he does that thing, dun, dun, you know, like that, where I might actually just sort of like physically be more imposing where I lean my energy towards them. Uh, and if that scares them a little bit, great. I'm not actually going to get in a fist fight unless they throw the first punch and then I'm game. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, whatever it takes. Uh, I, I'm not afraid of someone wearing sunglasses for sure. And uh, if that's something that you can use to your advantage, Go for it. Gotcha. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to do one more live question, and then we're going to jump into uh, some that came from the Masterclass community in the time leading up to our time together. Um, so one more. Let's see. Um, um, okay, so um, this is from uh, Stefan. It might be Stefan. I apologize if I mispronounced it. Um, I would love to know how to slow play, or, or sorry, how to slow the game down. The math and the reads seem easier when I'm not at the table. But as soon as I sit down, my, my mind races. What, uh, what insight do you have for, for Stefan? 
Well, that's, you know, that's interesting. That's a problem I guess we all have, right? So if you're studying away from the table, you have all the time in the world to study a poker hand, right? You can take four hours. I've actually, when I've worked with other coaches and stuff, we spent four hours on one hand, just mm-hmm. breaking down every part of it. So, so it's a different skill set, right? Um, similar to chess, right? Where some people can play, you know, you play chess where you have eternity to move. And then there's speed chess where, you know, you're forced to make moves really, really quickly. So that's like a muscle in your brain that will get better with time. There's unfortunately no easy fix for that other than maybe finding ways to simplify your game, right? So let's say you're dissecting hands at a very deep level away from the table. Well, you're not going to have the luxury of spending 15 minutes to make every decision. So maybe simplify it a little bit more. Um, And the more you do that, you know, occasionally you will take a little bit more time because it's a more complicated issue. Um, But if you are, you know, finding yourself like your mind racing and your heart racing, I think that everything we sort of talked about, both Davis and I about mindfulness and, you know, deep breaths and just being centered and present um, is going to be helpful in that regard. But I would imagine with time that will subside. The fact that you're preparing outside of the game is really powerful and really great. So that sets you up far more, like far ahead of most people already. Just so you're, so you're already like right ahead. And you're, you're well ahead right off the bat. Great. Well, thank you. Um, all right. So now we're going to jump into uh, some more questions. We're going to keep them coming. Like I said, these are uh, from the Masterclass community who submitted them just a little while ago. Um, so this is a question from, uh, from Alwyn, uh, and he said, uh, I've been having trouble playing at the micro stakes. Um, and so what would your, be your top two or three best pieces of advice for people playing at that level? Like bluff less, go for value, over bet. And if you don't mind quickly, just, uh, for those at home who don't know what micro stakes are, just a quick overview of what that is. Okay. So depending on your definition, you know, there's high stakes poker, which is what I typically play. Then you can have what's known as mid stakes, which is mid limits. And then you have like low stakes and then below low is like micro stakes. So micro stakes, we're talking like five cent, 10 cent blinds, things like that. Um, and typically at the micro stakes level, you're going to run into like not a lot of professionals. You're going to run into a lot of amateurs, a lot of beginners, frankly, who are just like, you know, learning how to play the game. So the best way to adjust to playing against players like that, and they are the easiest games to beat. Now, they can also be the most frustrating because you're not going to be able to do any fancy schmancy stuff like bluffing people or, you know, thinking like, oh, they should have thought of that. No, 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 no. Anytime you're thinking they should have done something, then you're making the mistake because you're giving them too much credit potentially. So, So to answer the question directly as well, more value betting, right? Way less bluffing right? Smaller bluffs, like you can bet flops, but I would imagine too, at micro stakes, you see a lot more people in each hand, right? So if you have like four or five people seeing the flop every single hand, it takes a much stronger hand to continue. So, you know, you, you, so you basically, you know, when you do have it, you're just going to be playing more of a value bet style and not looking to really outthink your opponents. You're just going to out fundamental them mm-hmm. where you're just simply playing stronger hands in better positions and continuing when you have better percentage to win the hand. Got it. Cool. And that actually um, kind of segues in an interesting way to another member question that we had. Um, and this one is from Katarzyna. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. Um, but so her question was about how to play well when your opponents uh, are less experienced and are making unpredictable decisions. So does that change at all? Like when you know that you can peg that person as an inexperienced person? Well, yeah. So here's the thing that you do, right? First and foremost, you want to focus number one, like stage one is focus on your fundamentally sound game, right? So you play your, you play properly, regardless of what anybody else is doing. You know, to play ace king in this position, you know, to fold jack four. So you, you play your game. Now, when you're dealing with some inexperienced players, it's important to categorize what type, okay? Because they're not all the same. Some inexperienced players are just very meek, very weak. They call a lot. They call every bet. They don't really bet themselves. And when they do bet, they always have it. We categorize those as weak passive players, right? Then you have others who just like raising every hand, going all in with garbage, just like completely nuts, you know, just pushing the envelope a lot. So you want to know first and foremost, all right, what type of inexperienced play am I playing? Now you play two different ways. You you adjust differently to, to either. Against the weak passive player, obviously, if they make a big bet, you don't pay them off. You fold your hand. Um, you can push them around a little bit, maybe. Um, you know that they're going to call you. Against the other one, the wild and crazy guy, that's when you want to slow play a little bit more. If they're going to you know, hang themselves, you let them. So you give them rope, if you will, mm-hmm. as an expression that's used. Give them the rope and let them hang themselves. So you play a little more passively against that player and just play solidly. And eventually, that player will likely bluff at the wrong pot or you know, 
call you with a weak inferior hand and you just wait for the cards. So in a lot of ways, playing against inexperienced players can seem a little boring because you're just depending on the cards to sort of bail you out, but it's also the most lucrative, the most profitable. Got it. Yeah. It's like, it just astounds me that there's always information to be gleaned, you know, cause like somebody's, you know, their, uh, their first reaction to something like that is kind of just being like, ah, oh, man, like these rookies, like I can't play against them because they're so unpredictable um, and just get frustrated. Biggest, yeah. So the biggest common mistake people tell me all the time is like, oh man, I can't beat these, you know, these idiots in the micro six game, but if I could play in your bigger game, you know, where, where people respect my raises or I can read people's hands. I'm like, okay, so wait a minute. You're playing with like eight people who are awful, terrible poker players, and you're not winning. But you think you can sit with seven <laughs> pros, and because you can figure it out, you beat them. It's not how it works. Generally speaking, the higher the stakes, the tougher the opponent. So if you're not beating the low stakes, it's not as simple as, oh, if I moved up to where they respect my raises, I would win. Yeah. And just figure out a way to win there. You know, it's just this constantly analyze your game, figure out ways to, to optimize things. So uh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so we have time for just a couple more. Um, so this one comes in from John and he was curious. Um, so when you're as accomplished as you are, as somebody is, excuse me, I got to start over. When you are as accomplished at poker as you are, do you still consider it gambling? No, I don't. Not exactly. Right. So I would ask myself this. If you're a stockbroker, do you consider yourself a gambler? If you open up a brand new restaurant in a new city that's new, let's a vegan restaurant in like the middle of a meat, are you a gambler? Yeah, I'd say so. You're taking a risk, right? So pretty much everything you do in business, getting married is a little bit of a gamble. Sometimes they don't work out, I heard. Um, so, I mean, we could essentially all call ourselves gamblers, gamblers to a certain degree. I consider myself a probabilistic investor. You know, I'm looking at no different than, you know, someone who plays the market. Sometimes they make money, sometimes they lose money. But, in, you know, if they're, they're, the odds are in their favor in the long run to make money. So if Davis played poker with me, he would be gambling, I would be working, is how I would put it. Got it, got it. Um, yeah, I think I would be gambling. I'm, I'm never gonna not be gambling. <laughs> as, <laughs> hard as, as hard as I work, you know, it's just, uh, it's, I'm, I'm always gonna have to rely on luck, but you know, maybe I can, uh, the one, I mean, just as simple as it sounds, the thing where I came, so coming into the class, I may, might have played four poker hands, or maybe a little bit more, but I was just so bad. And the first thing that I took away from researching and talking with you um, that actually has helped tremendously was play better hands. It's just like right like off the top. It's like, don't, if you get junk, you're not going to win. The odds are not in your favor. Just let it go. Like it's okay to fold. And so that was like really impactful for me. Um, so anyway, um, so we have one more, one more question coming in. Um, let me see. So um, how does uh, what you learn from the poker, the poker strategy translate to other aspects of your life? Um, are there any specific examples or uh, success stories would be appreciated? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things we've touched on throughout is, you know, sort of the emotional stability required to be a poker player. You know, it's a lot different. You know, it's when you make, when you get a paycheck every month and you know exactly how much it is, you can plan for that. When you're a poker player, you don't really have that luxury. So you can go through periods of like high stress. Um, so learning how to deal with that high stress and being able to try to stay even keel, you know, during the upswings and during the down um, seeps over into your regular life too. It can, it can, there's pros and cons with that you know, keeping your emotions in check, if you will, you know, you don't want to do that with your wife. Like you, you, you want to be connected and you want to be emotional. You don't, you don't want to have your poker face on 24 seven, but I would say that also, um, you know, in poker, you take a lot of what's called bad beats, right? Where you're like, Oh man, I just got so unlucky in this situation. So the more often you you get accustomed to that, when things happen in life, you look at it and you say, you know what? It was unlikely, but there was still a probable chance that it could happen. So you look, you, you, you learn to think differently too. Like, you know, you know, something like, well, you know, it rained today. Uh, there was a 20% chance that was going to happen. Such is life. And, and you, you learn to deal with um, the ebbs and flows of, uh, you know, real life situations, I think uh, a little bit more probabilistically, if that's even a word. <laughs> it might be. I, I'm, I'm it is say, now. I just made it. Yeah, exactly. If it's not, it should be. And you heard it here first. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, well, Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the end of our segment. Is there anything that you'd like to share uh, with your viewers before we sign off? Well, just, you know, thanks for uh, joining us for the hour. I hope you guys uh, got a lot out of the hand reviews. It's one of the best ways to sort of learn how to play hands. Um, and, you know, we don't know how long we're going to be in this quarantine. So I would highly recommend 
you know, if you've got time, you jump online, practice what, what, I, what I've been preaching, put it to the test. Uh, it's a good way to, you know, kill some time. Um, and, you know, take care of yourselves out there and uh, be healthy. And, you know, like, like as we talked about, you know, there's nobody ever said like, uh, there's, no, there's, no, <laughs> there's, no, there's no job, there's no thing that being physically fit or watching what you eat um, doesn't help with. So during this time, while you're home, might be something worth focusing on. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that reminds me of that thing that I forgot right when we were talking, but it was essentially just that it, it made, I found that it makes you mentally sharper. You know, if I, if I am not exercising before I go do something before my day, I find that, that I'm so sluggish. And I can imagine that when you have to have those quick, those quick decision making that uh, the, you know, just being physically fit goes a long way. Science, bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so as a reminder, Masterclass Live takes place every Wednesday. Um, I hope you guys will turn, tune in next week because we have Sarah Blakely joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she is the founder of the wildly successful company Spanx. Um, so that's going to be happening on Wednesday the 13th at 5 p.m. Pacific. And um, let's keep the conversation going. We'd love to see your tweets of your favorite Masterclass Live learnings um, with the tag at master, hashtag Masterclass Live. And for the community members of Masterclass, we hope you'll get in there and let everybody know what your favorite moment was. Daniel, thanks again. See you later. Take care.